Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Hashtag Sports and our signature rapid fire segment where I'm joined by the generally likable know it all from Cover One, Greg Tomset. Uh, and no pun intended, this gentleman who covers all topics Bills related. So, and he does an absolutely phenomenal job. So, make sure at the c- conclusion of the video, you go down in the description and follow him on YouTube and you follow their YouTube page and you follow him on Twitter. He's got content coming out constantly about the Buffalo Bills. You want to talk about contracts? He's got it you want to talk about on the field play he's got it uh and you know you know he tends to mix in uh, things here and there that are actually pretty entertaining on on twitter as well and we are lucky enough to have him once again back on hashtag sports for our rapid fire segment um greg how you doing today bud not too bad man and i appreciate it for everybody listening at least half the stuff mario said is true <laughs> well it's it's funny too because not a lot of things are true in the sense that we have a rapid fire segment, but these are sometimes our longer segments that we've run, uh, Paul and I, when we have it. So basically what it go, what it is is everyone in Hashtag Nation throws in a bunch of questions to Paul and I, and then we try to answer them as we're driving in the car. However, due, due to the quarantine and everything else is going on, we can't really do that. So yeah, it's I, a, lot, a lot of people with more time to ask questions now. Yeah, true. It's, it's <laughs> interesting. But we decided to put a little twist on it. And here's a little twist that I did, I did not mention to Greg earlier before. Uh, so he's going to be presented a question. Greg already has the questions that I've given him. Whatever he says, I have to try to present a counterpoint to it. So mm. I may make some enemies. I may make some friends. Who knows? Uh, I'm countering Greg Tomset. So therefore, I happen to agree with a lot of things that Greg says, both on Twitter and on, on his streams. So this is going to be kind of difficult for me. But that being said, let's just dive into the first question. Um, I like it. Uh, Steve Hampton comes in. He says, do you expect to see any differences in the play calls this upcoming season? And if so, what do you think we will see more of that we didn't see last season? So I I do expect to see it. I I think that there's a narrative that because of Sean McDermott's personality and some of the history of what they've shown, that we just are by definition a run-heavy team. And I think that that has been the scheme and logic that makes sense as you have a rookie and a second year quarterback and as you have a strong defense and are trying to mitigate risk and limit liability of what the offense could do. I don't think that's the same as saying that's our dyed in the wool um, only option going forward. So I actually expect it to lean further pass heavy this year. I'm not saying we're going to turn into the Cardinals air raid, um, <laughs> but I expect it to be much closer to middle of the road, 13th to 15th in passing run ratio versus I think we we're 23rd this past year. Um, you know, adding a player like Stefan Diggs obviously goes that direction. And Brian Dable showed that we had plenty of games where we started out really pass heavy and then kind of salted away the lead at the end um so that might risk it because i I think we're going to be a very good team this year and i think we're going to be able to salt away some leads um but i expect it to be a little bit more pass heavy than what i think many fans assume that oh no we're a grinded out run tough team i think we're going to see more passing than teams expect it's interesting that you say that because that happens to be the stigma on a lot of defensive head coaches when they come in is that they want to run the ball. Well, it's not so much they want to run the ball. They want to control the ball on the offensive side where they don't want to have turnovers to put their defense in bad positions, and that's the best way to protect your defense a lot of times. So I have to try to take the opposite side. So I'm going to say that they're with – with Devin Singletary and the production that he was able to have in 2019 and the – running back you're going to draft at 54 uh you're going to end up running the ball quite a bit i'm sorry i had to it's, um, it, hey it's it's not everything's on the table um but i really do believe that it, it, you know if i could be serious for a second i know it doesn't happen but getting the addition of stefan Diggs, i think does open up devin singletary a lot because teams aren't allowed to just crowd the box on you now and they're gonna have to take a guy out of the box they're gonna have to uh devote some time and, and some attention to stefan Diggs, and also with the 70 percent that the buffalo bills ran three wide receiver sets last year it is very uh, it's going to be very favorable to them to to run the ball a little bit more with Devin Singletary. And I think he's going to see an uptake in carries, uh, which will eventually open up 
open up the pass game. So uh, if, if I could try to offer a counter, that's my best counter to you. Uh, I, yeah, I think it makes I, sense. I do agree. I do agree with that, though. I mean, it's, it seems like the Buffalo Bills – uh, I mean, when they came out against the New York Jets, they threw 18 straight passes. I mean, that doesn't seem like a very run-focused uh, te- team. So um, I'm looking for improvement in the offense as a whole. So, yeah, I mean, they talk so much in the press conferences after games, the end-of-season presser, that they've been very open of the fact that passing is how you score points we need to score more points it's it's not like they're hiding from that i think and for the fans to say oh well come on look at the results they're right i mean we have run the ball more than the average team i would i would ask people to temper themselves embrace themselves that just because that's what has happened doesn't mean that's the only option of what can't happen yeah ep system greg pass the score run to win that's how they they, I, i am certain dable would rather pass Oh yeah, he would. <laughs> he would like to cement his legacy in the NFL. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Elliot Eisler comes in next. He said, "Team McBean have set themselves up to trade back up into the third and fourth rounds. As deep as this team is after free agency, would you rather us keep those late draft picks or use them to trade up and bring home three good, great guys versus bringing back seven, which uh, in which picks five to seven may not even make the team?" Okay. Hmm. Um. So there's a couple different things here. Yep. One, Bean's history has shown, and he just talked about it in the press conference with the the media here earlier this week, that if he sees a guy that he thinks is a perfect fit, he's fine trading up for that, even with the perception that he overpaid a little to get them, because he'd rather do that to know that, hey, I know this guy's going to fit and is what we're looking for and is the last of a talent tier that's dropping off, and I'd rather go get that and trust my scouting than wait and let it fall to me and just pick the best of what's left and I might not be excited about it. So um, in three drafts so far under McDermott and Bean and counting in that first year as a mix of the two, even though Bean wasn't in the room on draft mm-hmm. day, they've traded up six times and traded down zero times. I don't think that means that they can't or never will, but that's enough of a trend for me to assume that they'd rather go get their guy than wait and let it fall to them. You add on to the fact that we don't have seven roster spots available right now, short of really some fine-tuned specialists being added in at the end. Um, I'd be shocked if we have room for seven rookies to make the 53-man roster. The counter to that that I'll try not to preempt too much of your your uh, response is I think fans think it's a lot easier to get extra second and third round picks than what it is. And if you took every single pick, our fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth, and seventh, all five of those on the trade value charts, I think it's enough to go from the middle of the fourth round to the beginning of the fourth round. So if we combine every single pick, maybe I think some of the charts show it being the very last of the third round and technically like the compensatory 98th or 100th pick. Um, so even if we combine all those picks, it's not like we're going to walk away with extra extra seconds or extra thirds. It's more going to be, hey, can we move from pick 54 to pick 48? Can we move from pick 86 to pick 75? Yeah. Because, hey, this guy's running out and we want to get him. We can't believe that Daryl Taylor is still on the board at 75. We want to make sure we don't miss him. We're going to jump up from 86 to 75. So I do think we see trade-ups. I don't know that it's we're going to get three guys on day two. That's probably asking a bit much. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree on that. Uh, it, it's, it's so interesting to see now, now just to kind of, I don't, I don't want to correct you, Greg, but I, the trade back that would you consider the Trey white deal a trading back? Even though you said Bean was not in the in that Oh, room. no, that's a good call. That's a good okay. call. So Bean hasn't traded back. McDermott did in the first one. McDerm- that's a good yeah, call. The first one. Well, I mean, he was able to get the draft capital, obviously, to get Edmonds and Allen. We, we all know that story. That's been, yeah. that's been told many times. I, I think that, yeah, Bean is a mover and a shaker on draft day. And uh, it, unless you want some significant movement, well, I mean, from what I've seen from Brandon Bean, you're going to have to give up future assets, which Bean is really a lot of times not willing to do. Uh, he's willing to move within the draft and give up only that draft's capital to move up and down and do whatever he has to do. But sometimes in order for the Buffalo Bills, like you're saying, if you want um, you want them to make multiple day two picks and you think, that, oh, that fourth and fifth, and you'd have to give up like next year's second 
to move up and do something like that. Uh, the way that Bean is able to, to work it is that fact is if you have multiple picks in one round, that sometimes almost gets you just into the previous round. So like like you said, Greg, if you have two sixth round picks, that may get you. Like We're not guaranteeing that. That may get you into the fifth. You know, and then that's, that's even after all the compensatory picks that happen at the end of the third round as well. So, um, I, yeah, like I, I agree with you. I think if there's a guy that they have to go get, Bean is really going to go get him. He, he is a mover and a shaker, and you have to find out uh, in those rounds the teams that he could possibly skip and who he has to skip. I mean, we, we saw last year he was able to skip Carolina, and they ended up had, having to take Greg Little when the Bills drafted Cody Ford, and Greg Little did not have a very good year down in Carolina. So uh, he ended up making a good call in that respect. I know uh, people's um, people's opinions on, on, on Cody Ford at tackle have been kind of split you know, because we have all this time to ourselves to talk about it and think about it. But I think Cody Ford, uh, he's just, a, he was a rookie. That's, that's what I attribute it to. I think he did a very well, good job at tackle. So, and even look at, I always attribute his moves to the end of a talent tier. Go look at the linebackers that got drafted after Tremaine Edmonds. Go look at the tight ends that got drafted after Dawson Knox. Go mm. look at the tackles who got drafted after Cody Ford. There's a reason they moved up to get those guys and that yes that doesn't mean each of those guys are elite amazing picks but they were certainly the best of what was left mm -hmm. and there was a reason he went up and got them because you won't recognize any of the names that got picked after them no i, I can't even tell you some of the names yeah. that got picked after him <laughs> all right uh oh this one's gonna hit home uh this is truth to hearts um, he said, would you co-sign if we traded Trent Murphy and it was going on draft talks, if we, if we traded Trent Murphy in a fifth or a sixth rounder for a second round pick, uh, I know how you're going to dissect this. So I'll wait to your, uh, I'll wait to your finish with this one, Greg. Wait, wait, what was the opening part? Would I be what? Would you co-sign if we co traded Trent Murphy in a fifth or sixth? I'd, I'd carve a statue of Brandon <laughs> Bean by hand. What, do you, what the hell do you mean co-sign? If you, if you could get a second round pick for Trent Murphy and and a fifth round pick, I'd rename my son Brandon Bean. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Co-sign is a word you could use. Oh my um, god! If we if we could get Trent Murphy and a fourth round pick for a third round pick, that would be ecstatic. That would be amazing yeah. value. Yeah. Like that's closer to reality is that, Hey, you find a team that missed out in free agency. They, um, you know, weren't able to get the signing they wanted. They have some cap space. They are looking for that. We end up getting, um, I don't know, something crazy happens and Yeter gross models falls to pick 54. And all of a sudden mm. we're feeling really good. Um, or later on, say it's weird and a Daryl Taylor or a Curtis Weaver starts to fall into the late third round and we're like, hey, we could do this. Then I could see him being the difference in that range, a fifth, a fifth and Trent Murphy getting a fourth, um, a fourth and Trent Murphy getting a late third. I think that's close. Uh, a fifth and a sixth and a sixth and a seventh and Trent Murphy isn't getting you a seven in a second. So, um, I mean, short unless it's with Bill O'Brien, and then all all bets are off the table. Yeah, I mean, he may give you a lot. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, I like. So I, I like the idea of trading him. I think that's on the table. The value might be a little high. Oh yeah, but and and correct me if I'm wrong here, Greg. The Buffalo Bills currently his his contract stands around like nine million dollars. But if they trade him, the team that absorbs uh, Trent Murphy will only have to pay like what two? Is it like one point um, seven five or something like that? No, his contract's a little bit healthier. That's the dead cap that the Bills would oh, take. Okay, okay. So the Bills would eat 1.75. If they traded him, the team taking him on would take on 8.02. So okay. 8 million um, in his deal. He's got like a $6.4 million base salary, then some roster bonuses and workout bonuses, a miscellaneous uh, deal. The team taking him on would, would take right. that piece of it. The Bills would eat the 1.75 million of the signing bonus. Um, but he's got like some other per game bonuses and things like that. Yeah. Um, so maybe seven or eight million, depending on how those, whether those bonuses or whatever they're likely to be earned or not likely to be earned. Yeah. Um, but they'd be taking them on. And that's basically when I made the comment earlier, that must be what the agent feels like is his market that, Hey, <clears throat> if Brandon Bean comes to us with a restructure, 
and he's saying we want to take you down to six million. Man, eh, we we're pretty sure we can get that on the open market. We're pretty sure somebody's yeah. going to give us six million. So, yeah. you know, we don't really have a lot of reason to take that pay cut right now because we think we can get that. We'd rather just stay here and ride it out. And then Brandon Bean has to measure, okay, what's the benefit of releasing him versus keeping him as a luxury of a fourth defensive end rotation guy and using him in the comp pick formula next year that if somebody gives them $6 million next year, all of a sudden you get an extra fifth round pick. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's, that sometimes gets lost in the mix with a lot of people is that the fact is the contract that the, that the player currently has, and that's going to be traded away. You got to make sure that the team having that like can absorb that number one. And usually the, the trade off of that is because you're getting, if you're getting a pick back for that, the pick is more than likely going to be cheaper than the player that you're trading. So yeah. But that's why Greg was always including, oh, hey, if you want to trade Trent Murphy in a fourth, maybe you get back in the third. Trent Murphy in a fifth, maybe you get back in the fourth. So that's the that's the kind of the trade off that you're going to have to have. You may have to give up a pick along with Trent Murphy in order to try to move and, and get a pick here and there. But it, like I said, it, it, it's tough. He is, I think he's on the field. I think he's a very solid player. I think he's, I don't think he's worth the contract that he currently holds, but if, if the Bills currently think, you know, as Greg said, if it's a luxury to you, hey, listen, it, we cut them now and you cut them July 31st, it makes no difference. It makes zero difference to the Buffalo Bills right now. Rosters are at 90. You can, you can account for injuries here and there. The guy has been a solid player for you, probably a good locker room guy. I don't know. But that's that's one of the things that you may want to take into consideration when, when going into the offseason. So. I've said this a bunch of times with Trent Murphy. Fans need to separate – hey, this guy is trash and doesn't need to be on an NFL roster versus, hey, I kind of wish we were paying him four or five million and not eight or nine million. Because <laughs> if we cut him, he'd be unemployed for a day. Yeah. Like he would have a list of teams offering him a contract the next day. He would. So there's a reason he's still on this roster. It's because he's a legitimate rotational defensive end you know, caliber guy. And yeah, we're paying him a little bit more than that, but it's just not fans feel that, you know, seem to lash out that he's just this horrible player. Who's not worth being on a roster. Oh no. Yeah. How would you feel if the Patriots signed him the next day? Yeah. I've, I've been accused on our, on our channel of, of, of white knighting Trent Murphy. Anytime someone talks bad about him, because I, I love the, you know, the, the hard hat lunch pail defensive end. that just, you know, is going to be there, even though he doesn't put up gaudy stats, you know, he's going to set that edge every single time on that side. And um, well, and I mean, he's, he's not perfect, but no. he's significantly better than Daryl Johnson. Daryl Johnson's film was rough. Trent Murphy does his job. And yes. like fans are like, oh, he can just replace him. Well, last year he couldn't. And there's a reason that in the second <laughs> half of the year, Trent Murphy started playing 65, 68% of the snaps. And I believe over the final eight games, Daryl Johnson played 18 snaps total. Yeah. Like 2% over yeah. the final, the second half of the year because he couldn't do it. That boy needs to beef up. He yeah. needs to put on like 15, 20 pounds this offseason. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I, I take I, I don't want it to seem like I'm bashing oh, Daryl no, no, Johnson. No. He has no potential. The man was coming out of you know uh, the HBCU. He was coming out of a lower level of competition, never having the training facilities and everything that that's needed to be able to get to an NFL caliber situation, and was learning and going against. He was always just physically dominant against the guy that he was going against, yeah, yeah. and now coming to the NFL. So I'm I'm open to him improving this year, but he needs to from what was on film. It's amazing the guy, the caliber of talent you meet at Directional University. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, going on, we got Stefan Fritschley. He says, uh, "What will it? Quote, I mean, parentheses most likely mean to a player contract and cap room if the NFL decides to cancel this season." I think this is a very in interesting topic. Um, so, one, I'm going to openly say I have no idea, and anybody else who says they do doesn't either because it's never happened. So it's unprecedented. Um, the NFLPA is going to lobby that players should still get an accredited season and still be able to go into free agency the next yep. year. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed salary should still be paid. All the per game bonuses and game check money is going to be interesting how they'd approach that. Um, I, the NFL is going to say, no, these guarantees and salaries are based on playing games if you're not playing games you don't get any of it we already paid you signing bonuses roster bonuses workout bonuses those get paid out because they were based on that date triggering or that mm -hmm. event occurring like a workout 
um, but you didn't play any games, so we're not going to pay you any salary. And since you didn't play any games, you didn't accrue a season, so you do not advance in your contract, and you're still under contract the next year, and it would just roll over. And there would be an immense amount of lawyers arguing in between. So I, you know, I don't know exactly where that would haggle out. I wouldn't be, I, the CBA language was already very close to finalized when all of this COVID-19 stuff came up. So I, I don't know how much foresight they had to include language. I will say the language in, if there's a holdout was incredibly restrictive and that after five days you forfeited money and forfeited an accrued season before it was like 11 games now it's Mm -hmm. five days so that gives me an indicator that the owners built in a lot of leverage that if you don't play you don't get money so i'm gonna assume that it's closer to that side of the fence that um, besides signing bonuses roster bonuses workout bonuses you're not getting any money if you don't play games I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, listen, anyone who thinks that X, Y, and Z will happen due to what's going on right now, it, it's it's never happened. So how do you yeah. know what may manifest from that? The language in the CBA is, is very specific in, in the respect of the like what you said. I am so interested in seeing maybe a, a more simplistic uh, solution to this and where they just push dates back. I'm so interested to see because So if let's just say this, the whole season isn't canceled, but like half the season is canceled. They play an eight game season and they, they start it in, um, in, in December. Let's just say they play an eight game season. And it, that, how does that affect everything around it? Because then you're starting to bleed into other sports that may have just already started up again. Once again, you're going to bleed into hockey. You're going to bleed into this. You're going to do that. The, the, I mean, because they have specific contracts for specific sports and specific seasons. So it's so interesting to see how this all will play out and how it's going to go. The The money part to me is the most fascinating thing. And, and the, and the, like the first thing you named, you named was the accrued season. Like, Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be 25. I need to accrue a season to go into free agency next year. If they don't count this as a season, now I'm 25 years old. I'm a year older, and I still am under contract with this one team. Uh, it's going to be all the players so that got franchise tagged, and now are assuming they're going to be unrestricted free agents next year. All the <laughs> all the players that are at the tail end of their rookie deal. What if you're, you know, a, a linebacker or a running back that has a really short shelf life, and all of a sudden you now don't get that unrestricted unrestricted free agency you know it's it's anybody's guess you know I, i've seen a lot of speculation and my guess is with the timelines that are there right now our best case scenario is a close to the public training camp potentially close to the public preseason games with a hope that you can do fans in the regular season but i actually think that with how much the tv money is Having a no fan season where you only have game day team related uh, staff on site in the stadiums is more of a possibility than many fans realize that this may be a TV only product this year and that that may be our best case scenario to see football because the widespread testing validation and risk management of bringing 80,000 people together I think is going to be a way harder sell than, Hey, we think we can do this with 300 people uh, in the facility with the teams and that we're going to be able to show testing that, Hey, every single team employee has been tested. We're not bringing anyone in who tested positive. We just retested on Friday. We're bringing everybody into the stadium. Now that is a much more palatable solution to bring to, you know, governors, and, you know, uh, heads of the you know Center for Disease Control and, you know, Dr. Fauci and those kind of people leading those kind of um, groups that have by far the public interest and public health in mind and public safety and not the quality of football. That's going to be a much more palatable proposal than what I think many fans are seeing now. I actually think it's more likely that we see TV only football in 2020 than stadiums full 
you better kill all the mics because you're going to hear some things on that sideline and on the field that you're not going to want to you're not going to want to publicize. <laughs> it, it might be a whole new product. We might not even realize what we're inviting. You think but, uh, you think you know the XFL? You're going to see the XFL. I'm telling you, uh, you're going to hear some on the field things, and uh, <laughs> that'd be so funny to watch. But yeah, yeah it's, and, it's a very you know, real now, thing, very real. Possible. Yeah, I. And for me, if my choice is no football or football, but we don't get the home field advantage. I'll take football. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. don't get me wrong. Buffalo has great home field advantage. Yes, we travel and take over stadiums. That's a huge advantage. I want that. But if you're telling me I can give that up, but still watch football on my TV, eh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for that. The bathroom's ten feet away. I'm all right with yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Uh, last but not least, we have one more, one more question. Uh, Tebow, 1997. He says, what do you think is the ceiling for Devin Singletary? I, I could see him being a top five running back within the next couple of years. And go. <laughs> um, so I, I like Devin Singletary. Mm-hmm. I was super happy to be dead wrong on him coming out of the draft. Um, anybody who follows me on Twitter knows I'm a big fan of Ken Platt, who does the RAS and relative athletic score. Um, and just shows how you compare relative, and he has an equation that works out every mm-hmm. single metric, height, weight, arm length, bench press, 40 with the 10-yard and 20-yard split, 20-yard shuttle short, you know, three-cone, yeah. long jump, uh, vertical, everything into a percentage of where that ranks compared to everybody at your position, and then rolls all that up to a relative athletic score. Devin Singletary had one of the historically worst relative athletic scores of anyone drafted in modern history. I wasn't a fan on draft night. Um, Now, the things that you can't measure, like vision, contact balance, and things like that, are where he's elite, and that makes up for that. I, I do think it's okay to acknowledge that some of that high end athleticism also caps his potential a little bit and i could go back and i don't want to do this because i'm not bashing Devin singletary he had an awesome season i'm excited about his future i could go back and show you six or eight plays last year that were 15 or 20 yard runs that an elite athlete would have scored a 40 yard touchdown on that he just wasn't able to run away from people Mm -hmm. um and got caught so i i think that top five running back when you're talking about a Olympic caliber sprinter like Christian McCaffrey or a physical freak like Saquon Barkley and guys like that. I think Singletary has better vision than some of those guys has better contact balance can do those little wiggles and get a three yard gain out of a one yard loss that maybe some other guys can't some of his high end potential is capped because he's just not that great of an athlete. It's why I would love to have them get a Jonathan Taylor and Antonio Gibson. Mm-hmm. Uh, who is an elite athlete to pair with him. I'd love to see Devin Singletary be 60% of a really good backfield, and I think he can be a really, really good back. I don't know that I see top five in his potential, and that you know that, that's not me hating on him. I like him a yeah. lot. I just don't know that he has that in him. Yeah, you're talking about guys, uh, and i got to take the counterpoint. I have to say that he will be a top five back. I think <laughs> I think for the, for the simple reason is what – Brian Dable and this offense asks him to do. I know a lot of people, if we, if we talk about Josh Allen, a lot of people will make the argument, oh, it's a square peg in a round hole. You know what I mean? He's not this offense that was designed that Brady is able to thrive in. Can Josh Allen thrive in that same os- offense? And I, under, I understand that argument. However, the things that they asked Devin Singletary to do, and you're 100% correct, that you know there are some plays that, hey, Barkley scores, Elliott scores, McCaffrey scores, you know, on the, on those plays, but Singletary doesn't. But for what they ask him to do on a play-to-play basis, I'll tell you what, for a guy coming in as a rookie that picks up the blitz as well as he does, yeah. I mean, that's what earns you time on the field. You're not just a third down back because you can catch the ball out of the backfield. They call you a three down back because you could pick up the blitz on third down if need be. And he's just... Yeah, and I'm Greg. You know, I, I've told Paul about this. Devin Singletary is like that. Like, you know, when you're you're sitting there with your child, you're playing around, and they happen to stand up really quick, and their head hits you underneath the chin, and, and it knocks your teeth back. That's what Devin Singletary is. This guy's coming through the A gap. He, he thinks he has a beat on Josh Allen. All of a sudden, he gets popped underneath the chin. It's Devin Singletary. And 
for, like I said, for what the, the best argument I have is for what they ask him to do on a play to play basis. Um, he fits so well in this offense, but I agree with you 100%. His athleticism and the intangibles, his vision, and all that stuff, that stuff wears on you each and every year and each and every carry. And you talk about a guy who already came in the NFL with a ton of mileage on it. Uh, he, you know, I, I don't know if he's going to be four and out or four and like a one year extension or something like that, but it, it doesn't. I, I, see, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I, I just agree with you too much in the fact that I don't know about top five. I think he could be a great running back that fits this offense, that complements everything else. Could be paired with another guy, and I know Paul loves Jonathan Taylor. You know, ever, J.K. Dobbins has been thrown around. Clyde Edwards Hilaire has been thrown around. That's my dude. That's your dude. Uh, so all of those it, names. Clyde Edwards Hilaire is thicker Devin Singletary 2.0. Like he's got a little more juice. He's a little more powerful but very much that contact balance vision he really he's actually a better route runner um so yeah. maybe a good compliment that way but he's a very similar guy that if they want that style if you want the compliment like like where paul was going jonathan taylor is that high-end athlete that kind of guy yeah. that could add that kind of piece yeah he's he's he loved him so much he wanted to trade cole beasley for him that's for the pick to get up to draft him it's pretty interesting um makes me crazy it does. This is what quarantine does. You know, like, I want to trade players away. All right. But, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for once again, our rapid fire segment, which is anything but because, you know, we're going on a half hour now. Greg Tom said of cover one, uh, generally likable know it all. Uh, he is his links and everything for follow him. I'm sure you're following him already, but if you don't, you're doing yourself a disservice at covering Buffalo Bills news. Uh, everything will be in the description. We can't thank him enough for coming on today and devoting his time to hashtag sports and hashtag nation and to answer your questions. So, uh, Greg, you got anything coming up, uh, in, in the future of Ron cover? One? Uh, no, not anything specific. We're going to continue doing shows here. I'm going to do mostly mock draft and um, kind of draft prep over the next couple of weeks, getting up into there, into the draft itself. After that, we're going to go through an in-depth positional breakdown with each spot doing its own show um, and breaking down who we added via draft, who we've added via free agency, where that fits in on the current roster, what that nets out to starting battles, roster spot battles, potential trade targets, because obviously we know cut down day is when Brandon Bean likes to play his comp pick bingo and get back some of those <laughs> your, some of those picks for Russell Bodine and Wyatt Teller and those kind of guys. Yep. I think we're going to see more of that again this year, uh, and I'll break that down through each position as we go. So trying to find a good pacing to be able to keep bringing content to people. We've done some of these kind of sessions as well, live Q&A and things like that. That's been a lot of fun, and um, just like everybody else, trying to stay sane. Yes, absolutely. Trying to stay sane. Hope, hopefully your uh, hopefully your workout quarantine life battle is going well too, because my arms are about to fall off from doing so many push-ups. Yeah, yeah. My shoulder is not happy with me, <laughs> but uh, it's it's been uh, something to keep myself entertained. All right. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Greg. We'll we'll see you. And uh, hashtag Nation. Be sure to go on the description. Give this guy a follow. So, thanks, guys.